Excuse me. Good afternoon. I'm Kendall Trump with Grain Journal Magazine in Decatur, Illinois. Welcome to Facility Design, Maximizing Efficiency and Throughput. This is the ninth in a series of webinars to be presented by Jeeps and Grain Journal Magazine in 2018. Grain elevators represent a key intersection in our food production chain. These facilities have evolved from mere storage sites to large, high-throughput, highly automated processing plants. To date, information regarding the unique design requirements of these facilities has been limited. In an effort to summarize state-of-the-art design procedures for facilities constructed in North America, a review of these procedures and accepted standards has been assembled. With this presentation, engineers and designers should become familiar with the distinctive design process for these facilities and develop an appropriate reference base. Today's session reviews Dr. Kurt Rosentrader's presentation from Jeeps Exchange 2018. It was the highest attended session at the conference. And we do hope to see you at Jeeps Exchange 2019, which will be held March 9th through 12th, 2019 in New Orleans, Louisiana. Our presenter today is Dr. Kurt Rosentrader. Kurt is Executive Director and CEO of the Distillers Grains Technology Council and an Associate Professor in the Departments of Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering and Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University. For almost two decades, he has actively pursued research to improve the use of grain and products and has been developing a variety of new applications, including enhanced feeds, foods, biofuels, bioplastics, biocomposites, industrial intermediates, and ingredients. Please feel free to ask questions today by typing them into the questions box at the right-hand side of your screen at any time during our webinar. We will be answering your questions during a Q&A session following our presentation. We do have one polling question for you today. How many people are viewing at your location? Thank you all for your participation. As a note, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our website, grainnet.com, within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to the recording and our presentation slides. At this time, Kurt, can you please do a voice check? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you great. Now, can you also please show us your opening slide? Okay, can you see it now? Yes, we can. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Dr. Kurt Rosentrader. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kendall, and thank you to uh, Jeeps and Grain Journal for the opportunity to talk with you today and share some ideas about uh, designing uh, grain storage and handling facilities. And uh, just the caveat before we get started, we will talk about quite a few things. Uh, the slides will be made available after uh, the presentation today, but uh, even so, there's still a lot that goes into the design of these facilities that we're only going to be scratching the surface today. But uh, at the very least, I want to talk about a couple of things. Uh, talk a little bit about some history, talk a little bit about uh, overviewing facilities, and then get into uh, some nuts and bolts about uh, design, construction, operations, and then leave you with a few final thoughts. So when we think about uh, grain storage and handling facilities, uh, whether we're talking about grain elevators, uh, small scale storage uh, for co-ops, talking about storage at feed mills or grain elevators or 
uh, flour mills or ethanol plants, there are there's a continuing need to refurbish existing facilities, to expand existing facilities, but then there's also the need to construct new facilities. And so a lot of the things we talk about today will be uh, appropriate for all of these uh, activities. So there's a continual need to, to service the grain industry, and we all know this, and that's why we're involved with Jeeps and other societies to try to continue uh, the education of the next generation. So when you think about design information and uh, design data, the way that we design these facilities impact uh, to a great deal how they operate and their efficiencies and ultimately the cost uh, for the facilities. When you look at the literature that's available in terms of designing grain storage and handling facilities, there's quite a lot available uh, throughout the U.S. in terms of uh, extension publications uh, and other uh, types of publications, but there's very little when we look at the commercial side. Uh, Jeeps has done a very good job over the years uh, with facility design information, but there needs to be more information available, which is, is why we're talking today. So when you think about the overall goals for storing grain. Obviously, we want to protect the grain and protect it from weather, insects, rodents, birds, uh, microorganisms, and other things. We want to maintain the quality after the harvest. Whether we are going to be making human food or animal feed or biofuels, we need to maintain the quality or at least slow down the deterioration of that. And something to think about, when we bring grain into a facility, we can screen it, we can scalp it, but we can't improve the quality of each of those individual kernels. What we can do by the way we design and operate these facilities is slow that deterioration. Grain elevators also serve as a repository for local grain supplies, but they're also the uh, entry point into the supply chain both domestically as well as international exports. And oftentimes when we think about shipping grain out of a storage facility, we're talking about trucks, rail cars, uh, perhaps ships if we're talking about uh, a port facility. If we're talking about a small scale co-op, uh, oftentimes they don't have rail service rather. We have to think about truck uh, delivery and truck loadout. When we think about history, what we are doing nowadays is based in a large part on what has been done uh, for generations. We're just adding more science and more engineering uh, and more efficiency. But 1842 is the first uh, documented grain storage elevator uh, as we recognize it, uh, built in New York by Joseph Dart. And it was made out of wood, it stored 50,000 bushels. Unfortunately, uh, it burned down as wooden grain elevators have a tendency to do. We get to the late 1800s, and in Minneapolis, uh, PV and Hagelin built uh, an experimental slip form silo, which was deemed PV's folly. It was 20 foot diameter, 68 feet high. It's still uh, around today. You can uh, stop and get your selfie taken with that. But the things that we do nowadays are built a lot on what has come before. And even if you go back to the American Revolution, the very first book that was published on the design of grain storage and grain processing facilities uh, was by Oliver Evans and Thomas Ellicott. And it was an exciting time in the country because we were gaining independence, but we were also uh, the idea of anything's possible with engineering. So all of these designs really lead into what we're doing today uh, in terms of modern storage, but we are thinking much higher capacity, uh, much more sensors and instrumentation, much more uh, in terms of safety uh, and dust control. And when we think about what's happening on the farm scale, something like this, very typical in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, whether it's flat storage with like the introduction of the Morton building uh, in the 1970s or the round steel bins, but what do we see happening throughout the country right now? We see larger and larger storage on the farm, larger throughputs, uh, larger grain drying systems, larger material handling systems. And some of the farms can potentially compete with some of the small co-ops in terms of size and capacity and throughputs. And so what we see happening uh, on the, the farm scale and even the co-op scale, we see bigger and bigger facilities. And then we see on the commercial scale, we see uh, quite a lot of concrete, but we also see a lot of steel 
being um, put into place for uh, commercial facilities. And we also see a lot of uh, temporary grain piles that are being installed because piles are relatively inexpensive compared to steel and concrete. And uh, piles do have a lot of flexibility whereas the concrete doesn't have quite as much. And when we think about piles, depending on the size and the area available at the facility, uh, we could potentially expand our storage, at least temporarily, uh, quite considerably. And then we think about port facilities as well. So whether we're talking about uh, large scale on the farm, small scale on the farm, port facilities, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today will resonate for all of those things. So regardless of what type of facility, what type of arrangement, what size that you're working with, it's important to have the proper selection, sizing, and location uh, when you're designing a facility and then when you build the facility. Everything has to work together and a grain storage and handling facility is only as strong as the weakest link in the entire system, whether it is the inbound bucket elevator or a loadout uh, conveyor, you're only as fast as your slowest operation. And so when we think about designing a facility, we have to think about efficiency. So um, oftentimes we see uh, even the small grain elevators or the large farm scales, more than 20,000 bushels per hour in terms of uh, material handling capacities. So when we think about whether it's a port or a farm, uh, the fi five primary components that I want to spend some time talking about today, receiving the grain, distribution, storage, reclaim, and then loadout. Obviously, there are many more pieces of the puzzle when it comes to grain storage and handling, but the commonality for these five pieces, every facility is going to utilize these to some degree, some more than others, but there are lots of other things to think about as well when you're designing a facility, including uh, cleaning grain, aeration, drying, dust control, sampling and inspection, and then instrumentation and controls. And these represent Quite a lot of facilities have these at different levels and different degrees, but not every facility will have a scalper and a screener or vice versa. Not every facility will have a dryer. It really depends on what, uh, what the scope and the goal of the facility is. But for certain, I want to spend time talking about these because every facility has as much of this in common in terms of these five operations. So if we take a look at a large grains elevator, something that you would see in the Midwest handling corn, handling soybeans, uh, maybe handling wheat. So the first thing that you have to do is work with the facility owner or the company owner and develop a flow diagram to understand what are their needs, what are they trying to accomplish, and then how this breaks down into actuality. Ultimately, we're going to see something built like this. But it all begins with the first stage, developing a functional flow diagram that's going to meet the needs of the, the owner of the facility. When you look at a small grains elevator, something, for example, you might see out west or up north in Canada where you're handling multiple types of grains. Uh, you may have uh, some type of a cleaning core where you have uh, different types of grains that need to be treated differently, whether it's threshing or aspiration or separation. Uh, ultimately, they have the same kinds of things uh, as, a small, or as a large grains elevator does, just laid out a little bit differently. And it's difficult to see what's happening on the inside uh, because they look so similar on the outside. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this. So whether you have a scalper or screener or both, uh, the choices that you make when you're doing the design work really depends on what it is that your client needs, what it is that the, the facility owner needs, what are their requirements, what are they trying to achieve, uh, what are their opinions. Opinions matter almost as much as design standards when it comes to designing uh, these types of facilities. Something else we need to think about is operational flexibility. Just because a company is designing a facility to do uh, two types of grains for the next five years, it may change in 10 years from now or 15 years from now. So it's important to build the option for flexibility into your system at the beginning. It's much easier to, to design it in versus trying to build it in later after the facility is in operation. 
And that brings to mind the idea of future expansion. Many of the grain elevators in the Midwest, uh, they are locked in for whatever reason, and so they've chosen to build temporary storage instead of new concrete or new steel. Ultimately, though, we have to worry about cost. Uh, the owners don't want to pay more than they have to, and the contractors, the design-build firms, uh, they want to design something that's effective. But uh, cost is, uh, is the biggest factor for many of these types of things. So what drives cost? Let's talk about some design choices. Let's talk about receiving systems first. So receiving systems, this is where you bring the grain into your facility, and generally it is in some type of a hopper uh, that the trucks or the rail cars or the wagons are going to be dumping. Uh, if you're talking a small-scale co-op, you may be working with trucks and wagons. If you are a large-scale facility like a flower, you may be working with rail cars only. But ideally, what the receiving system tries to do is minimize the wait time, especially at harvest. We're entering harvest right now, and we hope that wherever we're delivering our grain has been sized appropriately so that you're not going to have to wait too long in line to dump your grain. So most facilities will design their hoppers for a thousand bushels or more so that they can fit uh, one load uh, completely uh, from some of the large trucks. So generally speaking, if we build our hoppers to hold a thousand bushels, most facilities will have uh, receiving equipment, uh, conveyors, bucket elevators, etc., at least 20,000 bushels per hour or more. And it's not just the hopper and the bucket elevator, but we also have to worry about gates and spouts and orifices and conveyors. And something that really drives uh, the underground design, if you're, you're putting a pit underground, uh, you, as you're thinking about how big to make each of these hoppers, it's not the face angles that we need to worry about. It is the intersection of the face angles, the valley angle, that has to be greater than the angle of repose of the grain that we're receiving. Otherwise, we're going to have the grain hanging up and not cleaning out. And what that basically means is the valley angle drives design. And depending on the type of grain and what you're designing for for moisture content, you may have to have a steeper valley angle, which means a deeper pit, which means more underground work. So when we think about angle of repose, it's important to work with your uh, design company to understand, are you working with average values for angle of repose? Uh, these are typically uh, common values that you see in the literature. Uh, if you're working with receiving wet grain versus dry grain, that's going to impact what angle do you, do you design that hopper at, what that valley angle needs to be. We also need to worry about bulk density later on when we talk about storage capacities and if we're doing anything related to uh, uh, blowing conveyors, we'll have to worry about aerodynamic transport velocities for the different grains. So other things we need to think about, not just how big to make the receiving hoppers and how deep to make those hoppers so the valley angle is steep enough. Uh, where do we locate the probe? Do we locate it adjacent to the office building, um, adjacent to the scale? Do we have a probe separate uh, from where the scale is located? How big a grade opening do you have? Do you want to dump uh, one uh, hopper at a time, or do you want to dump both hoppers at a time on your large semi-trailers? Do you have your equipment underground, or do you have it above ground? Here we see a picture where a facility uh, was built in a floodplain, so we had to build all of the equipment out of the ground, and so we had to construct a ramp, and then the receiving hopper and conveyors were all out of the ground. The picture on the right shows uh, underground facility where we have the receiving hopper uh, below the ground. So it really depends on, on your site how you, you uh, develop those. Other things to think about in terms of receiving systems, do you have uh, gravity or do you use a conveyor? Uh, the advantage of having a conveyor feed your bucket elevator underneath your receiving hopper is you can have a shallower pit uh, versus gravity only. You don't have additional conveyor. You don't have additional uh, potential damage for the grain. Uh, but the challenge with this is either the floor of your receiving house has to be higher or your boot pit has to be deeper. So it's, it's trade-offs. <clears throat> 
So one of the things that I would recommend is sitting down and either developing this yourself or working with uh, your design company and developing something, but trying to understand the receiving flow, how that grain is going to be getting into your facility. And so this is something that I, I put together that uh, will at least illustrate what I'm talking about. So if we think about uh, our base case here where we have, uh, let's just make some assumptions. It's going to take 30 seconds to sit on the scale, get your scale weight, 30 seconds to drive to the receiving grate. Uh, maybe we've got a separate probe, so another minute for probing. We've got more driving to do. If it takes approximately three minutes to dump our load, maybe the driver has to get out, maybe he's got to do some hand cranking, removing his tarp, whatever. If we say that's approximately 30 seconds, all up it's looking like about six minutes uh, from the time that truck enters the scale to the time it's completely empty. Now, why does that matter? Well, I guess it kind of boils down to how do you value each second or how do you value each minute? If you are working for 10 hours a day or longer during harvest, um, let's say you can get with this type of system, if you can get 10 trucks an hour, that's 100 trucks a day. If each truck is 1,000 bushels, and we know it's not going to be, but at least for design purposes, let's assume 1,000 bushels a truck, ultimately we can bring in 100,000 bushels a day. So uh, if we size our receiving leg at 20,000 bushels per hour, uh, all of this adds together to, to help us understand, is this leg big enough or do we need a bigger leg? Is the six minute uh, cycle time enough or does it need to be shorter? So if we look at a thousand bushel hopper and we're gonna basically fill that hopper one time with that uh, truck hopper once that gate opens, uh, it's gonna take approximately three minutes to fill that hopper. Now. If we didn't have to worry about the restriction at the bottom of this uh, receiving hopper uh, in terms of transition into the bucket elevator or transition into a conveyor, uh, if we have two dump openings, 26 by 54 on the bottom of that semi, basically we've got about uh, 2,800 square inches opening. If we had no restriction, we could empty that truck in 12 seconds. But in reality, we have to worry about friction. We have to worry about uh, funneling that grain down into that bucket elevator. And so what this is going to say is, yeah, we're never going to hit 12.8 seconds. Um, it's actually 360 seconds to, or sorry, 180 seconds to dump that. So we've got a lot of opportunity to increase our efficiency. So let's take a look at, since we built this base case, let's take a look at some of the other things that we can do with this. So one thing I want to point out, we can measure these things with a stopwatch. You can measure that for your existing facility. Do we have a big enough bucket elevator? That's something we have to think about. So what if we are bringing in 200,000 bushels in a day? What if we look at, separate scale and probe versus a simultaneous scale and probe. What would that do? So basically that would eliminate some of these extra steps here, potentially could reduce from 360 seconds per cycle to 300 seconds per cycle, which basically instead of 100,000 bushels per hour, if we do simultaneous scale and probe, we could potentially bring that up to 120,000 bushels per day. So 20,000 bushels extra. Now, what if we didn't have any slack at the dump? What if our truck driver uh, was set to go and the only thing we had to worry about was probing, scaling at the same time, uh, driving to the receiving grate and then dumping? So we could even potentially bump that up to 133,000 bushels uh, per day that we receive. Well, what else could we think about? Uh, what if we look at the effect of the truck size? Because we know we're not going to be bringing in always 1,000 bushels per load. What if instead uh, we bring in a truck that has 500 bushels? Maybe we have some small-scale farmers, 500 bushel wagon, 1,000 bushel semi, or some of the larger semis, uh, 1,500 bushels. If we are running this system at 20,000 bushels per hour, what this tells us, yeah, our leg is, is oversized in terms of bringing in wagons. We've sized it for a thousand bushel semi, but if we're bringing in the large semis, what we really need 
we need a 30,000 bushel per hour leg. So this is potentially going to be um, a hang up in our system if we bring in the, the large trucks and we're not designed for those. Uh, we could do some other things, uh, looking at the, the effect of dump time, but um, what if we could make the system even more efficient? Let's say just uh, for the heck of it, we put in the 60,000 bushel per hour receiving leg, and let's say that we have 1,600 bushel uh, trucks that come in. Hypothetically, if we have uh, simultaneous uh, scale and probe, we don't have any slack time, we just have drive time and dump time, hypothetically, we could be bringing in over 300,000 bushels per hour in a day. So what I'm trying to illustrate with, with all of these is this is something that you can set up. Um, so either internally, you are, you're understanding what could we achieve, what do we want to achieve. Uh, but if you're working with the contractor, then here's what our goals are. What can you do to help us improve efficiency as we're designing a new system or we're renovating an existing uh, facility? So let's talk about distribution, where we transport by conveyor uh, grain to its appropriate storage location, bucket elevators we use for vertical transfer, and then drag and belt conveyors, typically for horizontal transfer. We don't see screw conveyors used a lot, although I will show a couple examples for clean out. And then we have to decide, do we use square or round spouting? Do we line it or do we not line it? So a couple of examples here we see on the left. Uh, a couple of uh, bucket elevators feeding uh, multiple bins, multiple in, uh, uh, inputs into each of the bins. Uh, here in the middle, we see two conveyors dumping into each other instead of one single long conveyor. So there are a variety of sizes and shapes and, and designs, but which is best for you? Should you run everything to your bins by conveyor only? Should you do a mixture of spouts and conveyors? or could you, theoretically, just run everything to the bins by spout? So this is one of the choices we have to make when we design facilities. Just as a point of interest, uh, the world's tallest bucket elevator is about 575 feet tall. It moves 600 tons per hour of cement. It requires a motor of 450 horsepower to do that. So when we think about do we, how much spouting do we have, uh, versus conveyors, the question we have to answer is not, is the motor oversized for the bucket elevator, but rather, how much does that tower pressure cost to build? So yes, if we have conveyors only, we don't have to build a tower structure. Depending on the length of this conveyor run, you may have to split it into two conveyors, depending on the, the orientation and the size of the facility. So when we think about spouting, we have to worry about, uh, uh, the angle of repose of the grain, and we have to have uh, the spouting installed uh, at a minimum of the angle of repose of the grain. And what you're going to notice, the uh, rule of thumb for most whole grains is 37 degrees. Unfortunately, that doesn't take into account the type of grain or the moisture content of the grain. Even 40 degrees, uh, which is a preferred for many of the contractors, still does not account for the moisture content of the grain. So it's really incumbent upon you to understand what is that moisture content that we're typically going to be running through this spout. Is it dry grain, wet grain? Uh, what is the typical angle of repose for that wet grain or that dry grain? We also need to worry about flux through those spouts. So general rule of thumb uh, for a 40 degree spout, generally 60 bushels per hour per square inch. For 45 degree, it jumps up to 75 bushel per hour per square inch. And then for vertical spouting, a rule of thumb is approximately 100 bushels per hour per square inch. So depending on what that angle is, uh, where that spout is installed, will affect what that flux is. And that flux, how do we use that flux? If we know how many bushels per hour we're trying to get, basically we need to we need that information to calculate what size of spout do we need. So if we're running a 60,000 bushel per hour receiving leg, then how big does that uh, spouting have to be? We use this flux here. It depends on the, the angle of that spout as it's coming off the discharge of the bucket elevator. And uh, most uh, spouting companies uh, provide uh, nomographs or nomograms that show uh, what size of spout do you need to achieve a certain flow rate for a certain angle. And this is just one representation of that. But uh, there are a handful of spouting companies that, that provide this information. So 
uh, be aware that that information is is based on uh, actual data that has been collected over the last couple of decades. Uh, when we think about distribution systems, we also have to think about elbows and something to think about. Uh, a lot of times elbows are going to be uh, constructed like this or there are going to be some flexibility. Something you might want to think about, maybe expanding, uh, instead of doing a direct angle, maybe expanding that to provide a little bit of relief in the flow. That's been shown to be uh, effective at increasing uh, potentially the flow rate through that spout. Also something I would suggest, when you are constructing uh, angles uh, or elbows, uh, the prefabbed um, uh, elbows generally don't have uh, access lids. If you are doing custom elbows, especially for the large flow rates, 50,000, 60,000, 80,000 bushels per hour, if these are lined elbows, I highly recommend making sure that you have access lids so that you can get in and replace the lining inside the spouting. And something else we need to think about when we're designing spouting is flow retarders. Uh, depending on the angle of that spout and the run of that spout, at what point is grain damage going to, to begin to happen? Uh, there are uh, several of these nomographs that are published by the spout manufacturers and something that you need to keep in mind because just because you're putting 80,000 bushels per hour through a uh, spout uh, doesn't mean that grain is not going to be damaged. You have to worry about uh, what that velocity of that grain is as it's going through. So as you're filling a bit, there are lots of different options. Maybe silos, maybe steel bins, maybe flat storage. The way that we fill those bins is going to impact what we can store, how we can store. And depending on the type of grain, the moisture content of the grain, will impact the angle of repose, the bulk density or the test weight of that grain is gonna impact how much we can put in that bin. And we have to bear in mind that if we have one center point where we're filling that bin, we're gonna have a lot of dead space that we're not using in that bin. And a lot of times the contractors will, as they're designing facilities, design the bins according to uh, being level full, which will never happen. And so if you, are paying for the design for a million bushels, you need to design not level full million bushels, but effective storage million bushels. So something to think about. Depending on what that grain is and what that moisture content of that grain is, uh, how much dead space are you going to have? This is what I'm showing in these two graphs here for uh, dry corn, for wet corn, for dry wheat, for wet wheat. Uh, what we're going to see, the bigger the bin diameter, um, and the wetter that grain, the steeper that angle of repose, you can really see that difference in wheat, where uh, if we're talking a 40-foot diameter bin, uh, for wet wheat, we could have potentially 11, uh, 111,000 uh, cubic feet of loss or ineffective storage in that, uh, that silo. So whether you're designing for a wet grain or a dry grain, that's something you need to, to think about uh, when you're trying to decide how do we, what, how many bins do we need? How big do these bins need to be? And something else to think about, the bigger the bin you have, the more important it is to have multiple fill points so that you can more effectively utilize that space within the bin. And when you start to do multiple fill points or interstice bins, uh, it is much more difficult to estimate that effective volume. And so you need to work with your contractor uh, or do this yourselves where you can do 3D solid modeling to understand what is that actual volume loss, what is that actual effective volume within the silos. So I'm going to jump to the second portion of my presentation. I had to split it into a couple of pieces because of all the photos. So when we think about storage and we're thinking multiple fill points or one fill point. Uh, steel and concrete are the most commonly used in terms of large-scale commercial storage. And like I said earlier today, the temporary storage bunkers are becoming more popular too because they're uh, much cheaper on a per bushel basis uh, than either concrete or steel. But when we think about these bins, uh, we're talking bins up to 100 feet in diameter or more, up to 100 feet high or 150 feet high or more. and when you drive through the countryside, you're going to see that there's no such thing as a standard grain elevator. Everyone is unique. And why is that? It's because every company has different requirements, needs, 
every facility manager has different opinions. And like I said earlier, opinions matter uh, as much as the design process. So when you think about how many bins do I need? It's not just angle of repose. It's not just uh, receiving conveyors. Uh, how many bins do you need depends in a large part on what it is you're trying to do at your facility. How many different grains are you going to be handling? Are you handling only wet grain, only dry grain, or wet and dry? Uh, how is that material going to move through your facility? Do you need to do segregation of corn and soybeans, or corn and wheat, uh, or other grains? What about identity preservation for some of the genetic uh, modifications? And what about flexibility? How can you build flexibility into your your system without having empty bins uh, because an empty bin is just an expense. And how are you going to be controlling dust? So all of these things we have to worry about, they will impact what we decide to, to assemble in terms of a design package. So once the grain has been placed in storage, whether it's in storage for a week or a year, at some point we have to remove that grain, pull it out, and transfer it to um, to the flour mill if we're making flour out of the wheat, to the feed mill if we're making animal feed, uh, or if we're shipping it out to uh, an overseas destination or another state. Uh, generally speaking, most loadout requirements are going to uh, have 40, 50, or 60,000 bushels per hour or more. And we need to worry about how are we going to pull that grain out of the bottom of those bins? Are we going to do some type of a hopper bottom, which is great if we're trying to do um, identity preservation and self-cleaning? Uh, or are we going to do a flat floor type of silo, which is more cost effective, but then we have to worry about either bin sweeps or bringing in skid steers? Do we have one central sump or do we have multiple discharges? So in this example right here, I'm showing a couple of things going on. Uh, if you take a look, we've got a side tap coming out of this concrete uh, bin right here. It's dumping into the backside of a receiving leg. We've got uh, another conveyor that's bringing grain from another portion of the elevator into the reclaim leg, but ultimately they're both going up. Uh, what we see here is a screw conveyor for final clean out. So what we have, we actually have a conical bottom uh, hopper here with a, an eccentric discharge. So this is the primary discharge. This is the final clean out. On the other side of these bucket elevators, we see a rail reclaim conveyor that dumps into the back side of the receiving leg. And then we see another clean out screw conveyor for emptying out this concrete bin here. So uh, just a couple of examples. How you arrange the bottom of that floor, whether it's a flat floor or a conical bottom or an eccentric discharge will impact what your effective storage volume is too. So you'll get more effective storage in a silo if you have a flat floor and if you have multiple inputs at the top side of that bin. But uh, that's not always the case. Oftentimes we'll see either side draws, we'll see eccentric discharges. It's difficult to calculate volumes of things that are not perfect cylinders. So it's important that you work with your contractor to develop uh, CAD models, 3D solid models, to understand what is that actual effective volume and how much sand fill slick coat are you going to need underneath that uh, eccentric discharge. Flat floor silos, much easier in terms of bin aeration and ventilation. Uh, you can do aeration with uh, the conical bottoms, but it is more challenging to have an even air distribution throughout all of the grain. And something else we need to worry about when we're thinking about reclaim. What are you filling? Are you filling a semi? Are you filling a rail car? Are you filling a unit train of rail cars? Oftentimes we see problems when we get to levels of 40,000 bushels per hour or more. And oftentimes we see this with steel bins especially. We see uh, structural failure and collapse. And we see this happen every year. And one of the biggest culprits is having uh, reclaim from side taps. Because when the grain starts to flow, we have uh, very uh, difficult to estimate uh, switching stresses uh, as the grain is flowing down. Even concrete will have problems. This facility here was originally designed for 40,000 bushel per hour discharge. Uh, at one point in the last several years, cracks started to show. So uh, 
someone had to go in and install uh, additional supports to prevent any additional cracking from happening. So even concrete has problems at 40,000 bushels per hour. So when you think about loadout, you think about reclaim, uh, side taps are, are not uh, the best way to think about uh, 40,000 bushels per hour or more. But when we think about unit trains, uh, depending on what line you're on, whether it's the BN or the UP, uh, what kind of incentives are you aiming for? Is your time regulation 24 hours or 15 hours? So the bigger we make our loadout, the faster we can load that train, uh, the more uh, cost effective we're gonna be as a train loading facility. And not every facility is a train loading facility. But three common options for loading trains if you're designing a, a train loading facility uh, would be the bulk wear directly over the rail, which we see on the left. Uh, in the middle, we see the bulk wear built into one of those bubble bins that uh, we showed earlier, and then we've got our sampling and inspection, and then we have a tilt-up spout here. And uh, some elevators will use uh, multiple rail lines and a bulk wear that will feed a uh, conveyor to feed the the, uh, the individual rail cars. So a couple of examples. Uh, on the left, we have the tilt up uh, from the bubble bin. Here we have the direct the bulk wear directly over the rail car. In the bottom, we've got the multiple lines. So once again, I'm going to say it's important that you think about what are your requirements for loading rail cars if you're loading rail cars, and put together a, a model or a spreadsheet where you look at: Do I build a train yard, or do I build a loop track? If you've got the space, the loop track. Uh, is more efficient. And here, what you're going to see, we've built uh, 50,000 bushel per hour, 60, 70, and 80,000 bushels per hour for both a car yard and a loop track, looking at 110 car unit train. How do I meet these requirements in terms of 15 hours or 24 hours? Well, let's make some assumptions. And these are some things that you as a company should know. How long does it take to start uh, the train loading process and end the train loading process? Uh, what about switching? How many cars are going to be in your switching? If you have a unit train, you don't have to worry about that. You just pull the car through. Uh, if we make an assumption that it takes approximately two minutes to progress from car to car after the filling, uh, maybe there's some other things. Maybe we have to open the, the lids on the top side, or maybe there's something else. We'll add a little bit of extra slack time in there per car. What size rail cars are you going to be having? 3,500 cubic feet or 5,160 cubic feet? Well, depending on what your bulk weigher is, will impact what this fill time is for each of these cars. Obviously, the larger the car, the more it takes, but the larger the bulk weigher, uh, the shorter it takes. So ultimately, how long does it take to fill your 110 car train? If you're using a train yard, Let's talk about the 5160 cubic feet cars, anywhere from about 18 hours down to 14 and a half hours. So the influence of the size of the bulk wear can make a big difference. And if you are trying to hit your 15 hour uh, fill time versus your 24 hour fill time, uh, it looks like uh, really the 70, 80,000 bushel per hour uh, bulk weighers are a better option. If, however, you're doing a loop track, you've got much more flexibility in terms of the size of rail cars that you can bring in to your facility. It's, in fact, only the one are these two here, actually, that don't hit your 15-hour mark. So I would highly recommend building something like this if you are thinking about building a new facility or if you're designing facilities, build a model like this uh, so that you can see what size capacity do we need in our, our loadout. And so a couple of other thoughts I want to share with you, and these are in terms of maintenance, inspections, operational flexibility, and cleaning. Uh, when you're building a facility, you never know when you need to expand or when you're going to need flexibility. Um, in this case right here, I'm showing a reclaim conveyor that's uh, dumping into a reclaim leg. If the leg goes down, you're sunk. So one of the things that you could potentially do or have done is give an option for this conveyor to feed into the receiving leg also. That would be one option to increase the flexibility of the reclaim system. Uh, if you're reclaiming from the rail, so if for some reason uh, your rail car, as you're filling it, uh, doesn't meet specifications and you need to dump that, instead of dumping into the backside of the receiving leg, 
which is problematic during this time of year when you're trying to do both receiving and loading out the trains. Uh, maybe it would be better to have some flexibility to be able to dump to this leg as well. And so it's a simple matter to install uh, either Y valves or K valves. Uh, there is additional cost, but I think the benefits long term outweigh the short term gain in terms of you know, the capital cost versus the operational flexibility. Something else I, I'm thinking about is inspections and cleaning. Oftentimes, uh, it's important to make sure that uh, your conveyors are completely cleaned out or your bin bottoms are completely cleaned out, or especially this time of year, your dryers are completely cleaned out. I've talked to so many people who don't do their due diligence and clean out their dryer after they finished using it last month or two months ago, or they haven't cleaned out the bottoms of their conveyors, uh, or they haven't completely emptied their silos. So this is something that I would just uh, highly recommend that uh, whether you're designing or operating a facility, that's just something we, we need to keep in mind. So when you design a facility, it's really a, a dynamic process. And Everyone approaches it a little bit different, but ultimately we have to meet the client requirements, the owner's requirements, but we also have to meet building codes and design standards, both the concrete standards, uh, OSHA standards, ANSI standards. There's a whole list of design standards that we have to, to achieve and simultaneously meet the client's requirements. So this is the starting point, having a discussion with the client, understanding what they need and how you could potentially meet that. Next, you have to build a flow diagram to show how all of these five major systems, receiving, distribution, storage, reclaim, and load out, all fit together. And after you have a flow diagram, then you can start thinking about how do we arrange the bins? How many bins do we need? Uh, do we need a bubble bin? Do we need interstice bins? Uh, what kind of layout do we have? What size of bins uh, are we going to have? How high do we make the bin deck? How deep do we go with the boot pit? Uh, ultimately, these types of questions will derive from what we decide on the flow diagram. And ultimately then the process design and the structural design have to work together, not just for the five primary systems, but also all of the secondary systems, instrumentation, controls, dust collection, segregation, etc. So the structural design and the process design have to work together and ultimately uh, pull together a final design and then a, a construction which uh, hopefully the client will be happy with, have enough flexibility, and then um, be able to use going forward. Uh, so what I've done today, I've kind of shared a few thoughts with you. No, I haven't given you everything you need to design a facility. It takes more than a year generally to design uh, a typical large-scale facility. Every facility is unique. There are lots of different styles, different layouts, different needs, different requirements. But I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts in terms of what I think is important as you're starting the, the process. And ultimately, you have to make the owner of the company happy. Uh, if your design isn't going to achieve their needs or isn't uh, aligned with what they value, then uh, I recommend starting again. But um, anyway, I think we're, we're sort of at the point where we can answer some questions and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you all might have. Thank you so much for a great presentation today, Kurt. This concludes the presentation portion of today's event. We will now begin our Q&A session. If you have not yet submitted your questions, please do so at this time. Okay, Kurt, our first uh, question today. How would you go about initiating a facility design? So um, I think I will jump back a couple of slides. Um, you know, the, in terms of initiating a design, really it's a conversation with a client, understanding what their needs are, uh, what they're trying to accomplish, uh, what their preferences are. Uh, some clients prefer steel, some prefer concrete, uh, some prefer uh, bubble bins on the side for rail load out. Some prefer a bulk layer directly above the rail. Uh, it, it really is incumbent upon you if you're designing a facility for a client to understand what do they value, what do they need, what are they trying to accomplish, and then 
how can you pull that together into some type of a flow diagram that will potentially meet those needs? And instead of jumping to the layout design right away and the equipment sizing right away, I think understanding is, is a very important part of, of the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, what information do you need from facility owners in order to start a facility design? Well, some of the things we talked about today, um, what kind of grains are they going to be uh, moving through their facility? Uh, what is, are they going to be located on a main line for a, a rail, uh, like the Burlington Northern or the, the Union Pacific, or are they uh, a co-op that's landlocked and not connected by rail? Uh, will they be drying grain, shipping out dry grain? Uh, if you're talking about an ethanol plant, uh, generally you're not going to see a grain dryer located at that facility. So uh, those are some questions that, that you need to answer. Uh, to try to understand, it goes back to that, that first portion, understanding what the client's trying to do, why they're trying to do it, um, and what their opinions are. You know, some have very strong opinions and others don't. Certainly. Our next question, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges to design? I think some of the, the biggest challenges will be you know, with the variety of layouts that you could potentially have, um, which do you choose? Oftentimes, um, it goes back to what have we done, what has worked really well in the past, what have we learned from what we've done before that doesn't work so well. Um, that's, that's one of the things. Um, you know, every project is unique. And I think it's, it's important to understand that uh, what you may have seen or have done before may not work for the next client. Uh, or you read something interesting about some new equipment, uh, either at the Jeeps conference or in Grain Journal, and you say, we really want to try this in our facility. Well, we haven't done that before, but let's try to design a system that could do that. You know, uh, those types of things. Uh, something else that's a challenge, um, making sure whether you're an owner or a contractor, making sure you work with the different uh, construction teams, making sure they read the blueprints. Um, if a rail line is supposed to be installed at a certain uh, elevation, making sure it actually is installed at the right elevation. Or if you have uh, sidewall inserts or main slab inserts, making sure they're installed in the right location at the right time before the concrete sets. Uh, so that you don't have to bring a concrete saw out and correct mistakes. Mistakes always happen. I think uh, it's important that, that we work with our, our construction teams to make sure they, they read the blueprints and, and do what they're supposed to do. But I, and that's all part of the story. Okay, that is all the time that we have for questions today. I want to thank you all for your participation. If your question was not answered, it will be sent forward to our presenter. That is all that we have for today. I want to go ahead and thank our sponsors, M&M Specialty Services and VAA LLC for their support in bringing you today's webinar. I also want to thank Jeeps and our presenter, Dr. Kurt Rosentrader, for joining us today. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available for viewing on grainnet.com within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to the recording and the presentation slides. Our next webinar with Jeeps will be held on Tuesday, October 9th at 10 a.m. Central Time. We will be discussing FDA inspector visits, know your rights, and what to expect. This will be presented by Perry Nettles, Vice President of Operations at Food Protection Services. Look for a registration link in our follow-up email. I want to thank you all for attending, and I want to wish you all a great day.